even if he did, we wouldn't give him any introduction either um, to be equal to everybody. Um, but it's a pleasure to have him here, and he's going to talk to us about communism as commitment, imagination, and politics. You are really good. Thank you, Bruno. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Shall I speak louder? Is that now? No, the problem, you know, is I have to see, I have to... I have to adapt. Okay. So, okay like this? Thank you. Friends and comrades, uh, the first thing I want to do is thank the organizers of the conference for their invitation. And in particular, I want to express my deep gratitude to Alain Badiou not only because he could not join us in person in this conference that he had entirely planned in close spiritual community with Slavoj Žižek and is now experiencing hardship, as we were told yesterday, and he had taken the time to inform me in advance. But because it is entirely due to his repeated and personal insistence that I find myself tonight in your company, Alain and I are very old friends, almost since I met him for the first time in 1961, although in those years I was too impressed by his precocious philosophical mastery and the age difference, however small it may appear 50 years later, formed an unbreakable barrier. Soon after that, he decided on a completely spontaneous and generous move to join the small group, group of young philosophers gathered around Althusser and immediately brought to us a new impulse while displaying absolute egalitarianism. None of us could ever forget that. Alain and I over the years have had strong disagreements both philosophical and political, leading sometimes to quite harsh exchanges. And this was again the case when, after I had declined in somewhat aggressive terms, his proposal to join the conference on the idea of communism held in Berlin in 2010, he wrote to me that I had managed never to find myself where I quote, things are really happening after which each of us felt obliged to explain to the other why he was not worth much. <laughs> but we have succeeded to remain faithful to one another. I have the fondest memory of his marks of solidarity and gestures of esteem, and I have found myself intellectually rewarded each time I had to engage with his ideas or his arguments. I am sad that he's not here tonight, but I will try to do as if he were and address him, as well as you all, of course, as I would if he could react or even respond. The title that I had proposed with only a vague idea of how I would treat it in detail communism as commitment, imagination, and politics, has led me to building an argument in which I confront my own reflections with propositions from some of our contemporaries, indeed protagonists of the debate on the new communism, including Badiou and Zizek, which, as you could perhaps expect from a professional philosopher, follows a classical model. This is the model of three transcendental or perhaps only quasi-transcendental questions, all by it in a non-classical order. The first question, corresponding to the issue of commitment, can be phrased like this, perhaps. What are the communists, what are we communists hoping for? 
In stronger terms, what are they or we desiring? And the answer that I would propose, whose implications I will try to discuss as much as I can in such a short time span, is the following. The communists, we communists, desire to change the world in order to become transformed ourselves. As you notice, I use a floating designator for the subject of the proposition, they, we, this ambiguity being in fact part of the problem which needs to be discussed. And I make use of formulas which belong to a well-known philosophical tradition, partially coinciding with our idea of communism or by it somewhat modified. These two formal characteristics will reappear in the next two questions. The second question corresponding to the issue of imagination is the following. What are the communists, we communists, thinking of, or more precisely, what are they, what are we thinking in advance in the sense of anticipations of the understanding? And the answer is they or we are diversely interpreting the real movement which overcomes our hate capitalism. And the capitalist society based on commodity production and exchange or more broadly modeled on this production and exchange. In other terms, they or we are diversely interpreting effective history in the making. Finally, the third quasi-transcendental question is the following. What are they, the communists, or we, doing, or better said, to retrieve diverse translations of the term conatus used by some classical philosophers, what are they, what are we striving at, endeavoring, fighting for? And the answer could be, I will suggest, we are participating, or they are participating in various struggles of emancipation, transformation, social transformation, reform, revolution, civilization, but in doing that, we are not so much organizing than de-organizing these struggles. And now without further, further ado, let us examine the first question, the question of communist commitment. The reason why I ask it in this form related to hopes, desire, perhaps dreams, is that I want to right away explain in which sense I consider that a central proposition belonging to what Alain Badiou calls the communist hypothesis, namely the primacy of the relationship between idea and subjectivity, and as a consequence the intrinsically idealistic character of the communist discourse however distorted or denied it became when it presented itself as a materialist discourse, but I believe that in certain conditions materialism is but one of the names of idealism, is indisputable. But I want also to explain why I believe that some of the consequences of this indisputable fact are, to say the least, problematic. However, to say that they are problematic is not to reject the premises. It is only to ask for a philosophical disquisition of the consequences. The truth of Badiou's central formula according to which communists live for an idea or answer the core of an idea, adapt their lives to the model provided by an idea could be pure and simply inferred from the examples we know of subjects, both individual and collective, whom we consider to have been communists, since their 
have been communists. This is not a fully new race on earth, including, I repeat, those of them who, for whichever reason, good or bad, rejected the term. They were all idealists, both in the ordinary and the technical sense of the term, dreaming of another world and ready to sacrifice much of their lives, sometimes all of it, for their conviction, as Max Weber would say. This was indeed true of Marx himself one of the clearest cases of practical idealism in the history of philosophy and politics. After decades of attempts on the side of some communists, not all of them, but among them some of the most, of the most authentic, to present the pursuit of communism as a process without a subject, it is well time to say that a rose is a rose and not a bicycle, or that communism without a subject involves a performative contradiction. But what makes the communist a subject different from others is primarily his or her commitment to a certain idea, which is also an ideal, of course. However, one can add an additional argument, more speculative by definition. Excuse me, more speculative. By definition, the ideal object or objective of the communist desire is not something that is part of the existing state of affairs. At the very least, there is a difference, a distance that could become an abyss between what there is and what will be or could be and it is in this gap that the subject places his or her desire. To quote the famous definition to which I will return, communism is the real movement overcoming the existing state of affairs, changes nothing to this situation. Because subjects can either resist the movement or contribute to it. And they contribute to it only if they desire it, whatever the conditions, material or spiritual, which can have produced or favored this orientation. So idealism is the subjective condition for the communist commitment, or better, it is the philosophical name of that commitment. So far, so good. But now we have to carefully examine the implications of that ideal dash logical fact, one by one and step by step. And here perhaps we may find that the rigor of Badiou's insight, breaking with what I call the performative contradiction, is also accompanied by a certain blindness or a certain refusal to envisage all the consequences. This will concern, I suggest, the place of communism in a world of ideas, subjective consequences of idealistic convictions, fidelities, or faithfulness in his terminology, or identification with the requisites and injunctions of an idea, and above all, the modalities of the being in common under the interpolation of that idea which acquire a special importance in the case of the communist idea because that idea happens to be precisely the idea of the being in common in its purest form. But let's be very careful on all this, although quick, of course. A quick word to begin with concerning the place of communism in the world of ideas. Communism is not the only idea not even in the strong sense of an idea of the non-existent which ought to exist, or after which the existing state of affairs could become different, overcome its limitations or contradictions, make life radically other, etc., or can be represented as existing state of affairs as becoming different following an anticipatory move to which I will return. 
and not even in the even stronger sense of an idea which possesses the ontological and epistemological characters of the absolute, namely the coincidence of the marks of truth and the marks of goodness. I'm not suggesting that there are infinitely many ideas of that kind in our intellectual world, but at least there are several which we can try to partially enumerate. Justice, right, love, mankind, nature, the universal, truth itself, beauty, but also democracy, market as an ideal form of universally beneficial and self-regulated system of exchanges never realized in practice, or fully realized in practice, but which, but which can always be hoped for, and for which one can sacrifice certain interests. Even the nation, even property. It is important to notice that we receive all these ideas through signifiers, indeed master signifiers, which place the desiring subject in a relationship of dependence with respect to this signifier, however freely chosen. There's nothing special with communism from this point of view. And this is an element that we will try to reflect on the constitution of subjectivity relative to ideas in as much as they bear names or pass through signifiers. What to do with this multiplicity? It could be tempting to explain, this is a certain form of simplified Platonism with theological connotations, that all the ideas which are absolute or eternal, as Badiou would say, are in fact identical, or better said, form different names for the same absolute. But this is uninteresting in our case because it blurs the distinction, even the oppositions which actually give sense to the idea of communism and account for the kind of subjective desire that it raises or the kind of imperative that it enunciates. The idea of communism becomes meaningless if it means the same as the idea of property or the idea of the pure market, which are nevertheless ideas in the same ontological and epistemological sense. But you certainly has a tendency to suggest that communism is the only idea in the true sense of the term, or the idea of ideas as justice or the idea of the good in the philosophy of Plato. And conversely, that idea, or for this purpose, rather ideal, and communism are synonymous terms. And as a consequence, all the other ideas either are other names perhaps partial names for communism, such as equality or justice or the universal, or just the opposite. They are simulacra of the communist idea, such as the market. The case of the idea of democracy remains dubious. This could be a form of philosophical naivete, an expression of the personal commitment to communism the passion that inhabits his own desire, etc. But I believe that there is a stronger reason, which is that Badiou does not want to expose the characteristics of communism from outside in a distantiated or even relativistic manner, but from the inside, from the perspective, if you like, of what Weber, whom I quoted a moment ago, would call a war of gods but from the inside as a phenomenological elucidation of its intrinsic manifestation or revelation. The idea reveals its character only to the subject who desires its realization. And it is in these characters that the communist subject is interested. However, the problem will now become that it is impossible to analyze and to compare what differentiates a communist commitment from other commitments which can be also rational or mystic, civilized or fanatical, etc. cetera. 
Let us suspend for a, minute the, for a minute this comparison and return to the specificity of the communist idea. I believe that we can express it by saying that the communists desire to change the world, as Marx famously wrote, albeit he did not invent this idea and perhaps not even the formula. But more precisely, they want to change the world meaning at least in the first approximation, the social and historical world, the ensemble of social relations radically, whereby, and here I keep following certain well-known Marxian formulations, humans themselves will be changed or a new man will emerge in as much as man in its essence is nothing else than the immanent result of its own conditions or relations. Or the life of the humans that is our own life in as much as we refer to others and to ourselves will be changed. It is important to underline this telos implied in the combination of the two changes because from the communist point of view to change the world is uninteresting if it does not lead to a new form of life in which the human qua relational essence becomes different, reversing the characters of the life in capitalism, particularly unlimited competition, therefore permanent ranking of individuals according to their power or their value, and in the limit cases, elimination of the useless or valueless individuals. But to change the human in, the human involves changing the world, again, if by this term we understand the social world. Now, there is a causal dissymmetry in this articulation which confers undoubtedly upon the communist idea an eschatological character. But there is also a retroactive or reflexive effect which allows it to mark the difference with the religious eschatology in spite of the obvious affinities, in particular with religions centered on the perspective of redemption. I'm not speaking here of historical legacies, discursive legacies, but of logical analogies. I will present this retroactive effect or reflexive dimension of the idea of communism, which is a practical dimension, and here again, the idealistic determination is obvious, it's a, it's practical in the sense of practical reason, in the following form. Although the emergence of the new man or the new human life is possible only if the world is changed, the world can be changed only if the subjects are extracting themselves, emancipating themselves already from the determinations of the existing world, or at least engaging in a process of self-emancipation. Otherwise, a redemptor of whichever kind would be needed. Accordingly, the practical, albeit subjective, and reflexive dimension we are talking about is also a secular one in a fairly simple sense of the term. It is this world which changes, and it changes into this world, not another worldly realm, which is nevertheless radically different. And it changes through the immanent action of its men, its subjects. We could also say in a different terminology, more directly political, its citizens. Marx did not refuse to become called citizen Marx, who are already transforming themselves in order to be able to change the world. Remember again Marx, inaugural address or statutes of the First International. The emancipation of the working classes will be the work of the workers themselves. He speaks of workers, but clearly confers a universalistic dimension upon this name. Now this could seem enigmatic or perhaps tautological, but we can give it another formulation, which is far from innocent, in particular because it partially explains a contrario the failure of many communist attempts. The commitment to the idea of communism or to the realization of the idea of communism 
is a commitment that exists only in common. Communist subjects commit themselves negatively to begin with in the form of the elimination, the critique of their individualistic self, their desire of power, domination, inequality, in order to become the agents of a collective transformation of the world whose immanent result will be a change of their own lives, whether necessary or contingent, transitory or lasting, this is another matter which I leave aside with all questions of modalities and temporalities. We are perhaps now, in spite of the brevity of this description, which remains partially allegoric, um, in a situation to better understand what makes, at the same time, the strength and the problematic character of Badiou's understanding of the consequences of the idealism that he has rightly reaffirmed. There is something strange in the fact that Badiou frequently refers to a Lacanian heritage that he would preserve, whereas in fact he almost entirely reverses the articulation of subject position and the action of the signifier as cause of the subject that is so important for Lacan. And of course, a fortiori behind Lacan, there remains, like it or not, the Freudian legacy of the analysis of the community effects of the identification of subjects to a common ideal or model for built, which they institute as their shared ego ideal. It is as if for Badiou, the communist subjects or the subjects in absolute were also absolute subjects whose subjectivation is not caused by the signifier that they recognize as a master signifier, but on the contrary, detached from its conflict with the real. The heterogeneity of the symbolic and the real becomes a pure possibility of liberation. Writes Badiou, I quote from Hypothèse communiste, communist hypothesis in the French edition, page 188. C'est dans l'opération de l'idée que l'individu trouve la ressource de consister en sujet. It is in the operation of the idea that the individual finds the, the capacity or the resource to consist, become consistent as a subject. And there's an even better passage, but it's too long to quote now at the beginning of the uh, uh, a collective volume on idea of communism from the Berlin um, uh, conference in 2010. This might provide a justification for the hypothesis that the communist idea is different from any other and therefore a commitment and identification with the communist ideal works on its own subject in a manner absolutely different from any other. For example, the idea of a republic or the republic or the idea of the law or the idea of the market. Albeit, there's a great probability that the justification is tautological. All the other commitments would be heteronomous. They would involve a subjection to the master signifiers on which they depend, after which they name themselves, whereas the communist commitment would be autonomous, or if you prefer, in less Kantian terminology, it would consist in a kind of self-interpolation of the individual as subject. But then we need to take into account what has emerged as the singular determination of the communist idea, namely the fact that its imperative is a realization of being in common in order to prepare for the world of the common good. And the difficulty becomes redoubled. It becomes redoubled on the subjective plane as it becomes redoubled on the historical plane. It is very striking here to see that Badiou has a marked preference for an adjective far from innocent in order to characterize the kind of community effect that belongs to communism as a militant activity as well as an ideal to become realized in the world. The adjective intense, leading to the notion of intensity. For example, communist hypothesis, French edition, 169, nous appelons singularité un site dont l'intensité d'existence est maximale. We call singularity a site whose intensity of existence is maximized. 
It is existence whose intensity is maximized. But it is maximized because it proves incompatible with a separation or an isolation of the subjects themselves. And here, but you cannot but return to the concepts or perhaps the allegories that had served in the theological tradition to describe precisely an intense participation of subjects who transcend their own individuality as they transcend every form of power relation and hierarchic subordination to become members of the corps glorieux, the glorious body, or corps de vérité, body of truth, whose allegoric name, of course, in theology is Christ. And not by chance, this is also where Badiou insists on the decisive importance, I quote, of proper names in every revolutionary politics, and embarks on a provocative defense of the so-called cult of personality of the charismatic leaders, Mao rather than Stalin, inasmuch as they represent an incarnated projection of the insurrectional powers of the united people, and a ultra-political function of the idea, which is to create the we, we the people, we the revolutionaries, ultimately, we the communists. I do not say that this is either <coughs> absurd or would have nothing to do with the idea of communism. In the name of what I called a moment ago, it's essentially secular character, in the sense in which secular refers to this worldliness. On the contrary, but I say that it reveals the problematic character of the notion of idealism that Badiou has a tendency to avoid discussing. The return of the idea of communism, considered from the point of view of its consequences on the formation of a collective we aiming at preparing the conditions of its own essential change towards a model of the church, even allegoric, or above all, if it is not the model of an institutional church apparatus or corpus juridicum, but rather the model of what the theologians call the invisible church, has not only symbolic determinations, but also strong historical reasons, which have to do with the awareness of the consequences of another model that had governed much of the political activity of the communists in the 19th and 20th century, namely the model of the army with the very name militants, itself already used by the church. And more generally, the model of the state, or if you prefer, the counter-state. But it would be important, I believe, to recognize that it has its own ambivalent effects. A simplified presentation of the whole story could go like this. Given the fact that modern society, in other terms, capitalism, has developed an extreme form of individualism, meaning in practice de-affiliation of individuals and elimination of every protection against competition and solitude, but also the fact that it has compensated this dissolution of solidarities and tried also to control the conflictual and violent effects of this dissolution through the construction of powerful imagined communities such as the nation, or even worse, the racial community, the communist subjects have been engaged in the permanent quest for a form of community and community feeling that is both more intense and more disinterested than any of these imagined communities. The national myth is stronger than the communist myth in terms of distinguishing the friend and the enemy and maximizes the intensity of the community of France. For Badiou, it is the communist myth or collectivizing power of the idea, this is what a myth is in Platonic terms, that is always already more intense, more invisible, because it is based on love rather than hate, an argument strikingly similar to the discourse of Tony Negri with whom otherwise Badiou is in sharp disagreement. And as we heard yesterday, they now have the same reference to Franciscus of Assisi. But I wonder if this 
If this subtracts the constitutive relationship between subject and communist idea from every pattern of identification, representation, alienation, or interpolation, however, however you want to call it, with either Freud or Hegel or Lacan or Althusser. Or on the contrary, calls for an additional analysis of the dialectics of subjection and subjectivation that exists in communism as it exists in every commitment, all by it under forms which cannot become reduced to any pre-existing model. I will now have to be very schematic on my second question because I want to keep some space for the third. As you'll see, I could not keep that promise. But, uh, although, in a sense, it is this second question that calls for the most detailed readings and comparisons. If our contributions become published after this conference, or if another occasion provides me with the possibility to continue along the same lines, I will try to be more explicit. So I will ask your permission to offer here rather a description of the argument and a statement of its intentions rather than the full argument itself. I formulated the second question in the form, what are the communists? What are we communists constituted as a we through our common commitment to what Badiou rightly calls an idea, thinking in advance concerning the history in the making of which they or we are part, a resistant part or a subversive part, we might say, always located on what Foucault, who certainly was no communist, called with the Pascalian name of a point of heresy. And I tentatively answered, they are diversely interpreting the movement which overcomes capitalism. I could have said they are diversely anticipating the modalities of the crisis of capitalism and the possibilities opened by that crisis, whose main characteristic is precisely to be unpredictable in its outcome. I'm consciously playing on the terms of Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach to suggest that its first part, philosophers until now have diversely interpreted the world, its first part through a sort of historical nemesis has reacted upon the second. It would be a question now to change it. Es kommt jetzt drauf an, a very strange German. Interpretation was only repressed. It returned as soon as the revolutionary change or the change of the change, which is the best possible description of a revolution, namely a change that is not a continuation of the orientation and the instruments of the spontaneous change of capitalism, but a discontinuity, a reorientation towards different goals, and a reversal of the means of dialectical transformation as Hegel would say, passing from states or leaders, great men, to masses and men without qualities. As soon, I repeat, as this revolutionary change displayed its intrinsic equivocity or uncertainty or even, in fact, conflictuality. But this is not a negative fact, a catastrophic reversal on the contrary, it is profoundly associated with two characteristics of communist thinking today, in any case, which call for a whole epistemological elaboration. The first is that communist thinking, reflecting on the crisis of capitalism with the perspective of inserting collective subjects into its development, can be described as a permanent exercise of inserting the imagination into the rational exercise of the understanding, for which I try to use the Kantian category of the anticipation, and I'm not the only one in doing that. An anticipation is not a prediction in the sense in which positivist social science tries to produce predictions either on a grand historical scale or rather 
within the limits of carefully isolated models or systems of methodolog methodological simplifications, most of the time implicitly governed by practical, therefore political imperatives. It is also not a prophetic calling or announcement whose characteristic is repetitive in temporality and historical indeterminacy, which in fact explains its irresistible power on a certain category of subjects. But it is an attempt at identifying within the present itself the limitations, which are also limits of possible experience, where the reproduction of the existing structures the continuous realization of the ongoing tendencies or the applicability of the solutions to crises and contradictions now implemented will prove impossible, therefore calling for heterogeneous actions or interventions. I find a beautiful formulation of this point by Slavoj Žižek in the volume from Berlin's conference last year, which I had in French, forgive me un aperçu de la réalité historique non comme un ordre positif, a, ske positive, a sketch or a sketching of historical reality not as a positive order, mais comme un pas tout, but as a not whole, or not all, the Lacanian formula, une texture incomplète qui tend vers son propre futur, an incomplete texture which tends towards its own proper future. C'est cette inclusion du futur dans le présent. Did you write that in French or in, uh, in, in English originally, uh, Slavoj? In English, in English. You correct my uh, improvised translation. It is this inclusion of the future within the present. It's inclusion as a gap, yatus, they translated, in the order of this present, which makes of the present, or which, yes, makes the present a not whole ontologically incomplete, thus redu pulverizant, reducing to, to help me, uh, uh, ashes or uh, yeah, fragments, um, the evolutionist self-determination of the processes of historical development. In short, it is this gap which makes all the difference between historic historicity itself and historicism. Incidentally, this formulation is not at all incompatible with much of what Negri and other with whom Zizek has a fundamental philosophical disagreement. I return to this in a minute, writes on the issue of historical time. Indeed, they are both indebted or continuing a line that was opened by Ernst Bloch. The second characteristic is that tendencies are always accompanied, accompanied by counter tendencies in thinking as in history, as Althusser was never tired of repeating. And probably the two aspects are intrinsically linked. It is in the form of antithetic anticipations of the ongoing transformations of the present that the material conflict of tendencies and counter tendencies in history or in society becomes theoretically expressed, even if not directly or adequately or completely. Yeah. The idea of completely expressing the contradictions in the present is just as absurd as the idea of considering the present itself as a whole, a two. And therefore, it is inasmuch as we carefully describe and discuss a pluralism of interpretations of which we are always part ourselves, which tend to diverge rather than converge towards the same diagnosis, the same concepts, the same critiques, the same utopias, that we may have a chance to identify the play of tendencies and counter tendencies, for example, in the crisis of capitalism, which define our present, a present that is framed with incompleteness and non-contemporaneity. In short, there is anticipation, imagination working within the understanding because there is neither necessity nor identity, but contingency and divergence. There are conceptual determinations, I insist, these, excuse me, are conceptual determinations, I insist, not impressionistic denominations or ruminations. <clears throat> 
It has been my intention for some time now to address these issues through a confrontation of two others who play a prominent role in contemporary debates about communism and defend strikingly, strikingly opposite views of the revolution, or more generally, the change. Where am I? Arising from opposite methodologies, namely Slavoj Žižek and Hart and Negri, a double-headed other. In fact, they are almost enemies. One is here in the first row organizing this conference. The other is not. I mean, neither of his two heads, which is understandable for Negri because he's still banned from traveling in this country, but less so for Michael Hart, whose absence, whatever its causes, I find quite regrettable. I will give a quick idea on of what this confrontation, on what this confrontation should focus in my view. I have a formal reason to set up this parallel, but I believe that it is not deprived of relevance even to the strategic debates that concern the antagonistic relationship between capitalism and communism because it concerns their antithetic relationship to Marxism and as a consequence to the concept of history or historical time, that is historicity, involved in Marxism. It is almost as if, as if, the French <laughs> invades my tongue, uh, as if, uh, it, is, it is as if each of them had dissociated the elements of the Marxian conception, in particular the elements of the famous topography, to borrow Althusser's terminology, which allows it for Marx to explain the dialectics of history and the inevitable transformation of capitalism into communism, thus showing not that the unity of these elements was arbitrary in Marx, but that it remained paradoxical, highly dependent on presuppositions that are not indefinitely tenable or that arose from the intellectual and political conditions of a moment which is no longer ours. It would be much too simple, however, to explain that from this topography, Zizek retained only the superstructure and Negri Hart retained the infrastructure. The situation is more complicated because in fact, as readers of the arch famous 1859 preface to the contribution of the critique to the critique of political economy will remember easily, the topography consists not only of two, but of two times two, of four distinct instances between which a complex interplay becomes imagined or schematized by Marx. The superstructure is divided into a juridical political formalism and an ideological instance consisting of forms of social consciousness within which the historical conflict becomes fought out, Ausfichten in German. Whereas the infrastructure is divided into a structure of relationships of production, which are essentially forms of property, and an autonomous movement of the productive force, productive Kräfte, which at some point becomes incompatible with the existing relations of production. I'm summarizing the well-known Marx presentation. And it is, in fact, the paradoxical combination of the two extreme instances, that is, ideology on one side and productive forces on the other, that constitutes the essential mobility, negating the stability, or better said, the fixed order of consisting of the property and the state in order to achieve, in a given conjuncture, a revolutionary change. This more complex pattern allows us to understand that what Zizek has essentially extracted from Marx is a dialectic of the ideology, one is tempted to write again ideo dash logi, against the apparatuses of state, property, and law. Whereas Hart Negri have essentially extracted a conflictual relationship between productive force and the same system of apparatuses which they call the Republic of Property in their newest volume called Commonwealth. Of course, this leads each of them to reformulate and adapt quite substantially the terms which, which they isolate, and in particular the revolutionary term, which is what interests them most. Ideology in the case of Zizek, productive force in the case of Hart and Negri, 
combining philosophy, history, and political analysis. And of course, for each of them, the term that has been left aside and appropriated, so to speak, by the other represents essentially the germ of every misunderstanding of politics and the adversary of a genuine communist mode of anticipation of the future within the present. Productive force for Zizek, which would be linked, according to him, with vitalism, naturalism, evolutionism, progressivism, and the admiration for the creative capacities of capitalism as an economic system. And ideology for Hart and Negri, which would be linked with voluntarism, spiritualism, decisionism, terrorism, and the nostalgia of violent interventions to force revolutionary changes from above, using the proletarian equivalent of the bourgeois state to undo its power. But also, at the philosophical level, this accounts for the fact that each of them has an antithetic relationship to the Hegelian legacy in Marx, a legacy that is maximized or even entirely recreated by Zizek, whereas it is dismissed by Hart Negri, continuing ancient elaborations by Negri alone, as a pure expression of the modernist trend in Marx, which emphasizes the importance of mediations to transform the constituent power of the multitude into a legal constituted power against which Negri advocated the anti-modernity of Machiavelli and Spinoza, now rephrased as alternative modernity. But again, let's not be too simple, because just as in Zizek, there's no pure Hegelianism. There's a necessary intervention of a sublime element of terror beyond or beneath the dialectic itself, which indeed owes much to an extreme interpretation of the Hegelian description of the revolutionary terror itself, das Schrecken, but we don't have time to go now into all these details, and also accounts for the fact that at some point, the real, in the Lacanian sense, will intrude into the ideological realm and, so to speak, invert its function. Similarly, in Hart Negri, there's a sort of dialectical element, or in any case, a continuity with the idea that conflict, more precisely class struggle, accounts for the very development of the productive forces and the intrinsic relationship between a technical composition and a political composition of labor, at least until the point to which I return in a minute where the organicity of the system of productive forces, according to them, becomes autonomized or liberated. This is indeed the legacy of Negri's intellectual and political formation within the ranks of Italian operaismo, for which he duly pays tribute to the path-breaking interventions of Mario Tronti. I cannot lament too much the fact that Tronti is not translated into uh, English. So we are led to understand that in this confrontation, no less than a full radiography of the philosophical and political, political determinations of revolutionary thought is involved, which pushes us to considering the choices that Marx did not want to make, but also that we would not have to make without Marx and the development of contradictions in the legacy of Marx and it's the practical implementation of his ideas. This is not to say, of course, that other figures would be irrelevant to a complete examination of this heretic pattern in the sense of displaying the points of heresy of Marxism and showing their enormous actuality. But the Zizek-Negri confrontation has the enormous interest of illustrating a very radical polarity. Now, in order to name this polarity in the most eloquent possible manner while remaining faithful to their terminology and their discourse, and their discourse I will call the imaginative anticipation of the understanding of history à la Zizek, divine violence, following his indica the indications from the afterword of this extraordinary book in defense of last causes, where he appropriates the Benjaminian terminology. And I will name the imaginative anticipation a la Hart Negri, of course, Exodus, following the indications of the already mentioned book Commonwealth, the third volume in the trilogy that had started with empire. So Exodus is Exodus from the domination of empire that takes place inside the imperial territory itself, 
or to put it in Deleuzean terms, it is the line of escape that appears possible or virtually there when the power of the multitude that empire tried to control and territorialize becomes, in fact, uncontrollable. And I will summarize in the following manner what seems to me to form each time the relevant question, even the inescapable question that they are asking, each of them, the philosophical difficulty that they are handling in a disputable manner, and the determining problem that they are thus opening to be retained as much as possible in a synthetic presentation of the anticipations of a revolutionary understanding, but a synthesis without synthesis or that remains disjunctive, etc. On the side of Zizek and divine violence, I believe that the absolutely correct question asked in, in defense of lost causes, particularly on page 205, is the following one. I quote, how are we to revolution, this is Zizek speaking, how are we to revolutionize, to revolutionize, to revolutionize an order whose very principle is constant self-revolutionizing. This is a question which is closely linked to an interpretation of the articulation between revolution and the developments of capitalism, its capacities of modernization, whereby what appears to have been the case in the last century was not the fact, contrary to the hopes uh, uh, of uh, Marx and other Socialist, socialists and communists, was not the fact that revolutionary forces and class struggles represented modes of social organization more advanced than capitalism, but rather the fact that capitalism always retained, retained or found the capacity to locate itself beyond the scope of these class struggles, ahead of its own anticipations. But it is also linked to the interpretation of the new type of control that modern capitalism performs upon subjectivities. In Freudian terms, the reversal of the function of the superego, which leads not to suppressing the desire for enjoyment and affecting the murder of the father with inescapable guilt, but locating guilt, on the contrary, in the incapacity of the individual to liberate himself or herself from constraints and acquire a capacity, a full capacity to immoderately seek the, satisfa the satisfaction of his or her demands on the market. And finally, most crucially, it is linked to the critique of democracy as a master signifier used to produce voluntary servitude in our lib neoliberal societies and a juridical constitutional way to dismiss in advance stigmatize and expose to the brutal suppression of the global police any movement of rebellion, of transgression of the well-tempered pluralistic order that breaks, that would break with the standardized constitution of majorities. Often, in fact, due to the virtues of the parliamentary system combined with media distribution of information, these majorities are oligarchic minorities, but leave that aside. But this is also where, in my opinion, the difficulties begin with the scenario of divine violence politically and philosophically. There are at least two ways of understanding the normalizing function of democracy linked with the permanent revolution of capitalism. One is the idea that what currently counts as democracy is actually with respect to its permanent insurrectional bases or sources or its claim our original claim of equal rights and equal liberties for the citizens, a process of de-democratization, so that there is never something like democracy in a fixed and univocal sense, but only an endless conflict between processes of de which is a class conflict, of course, of de-democratization and processes of the democratization of democracy, which can take either a violent or a non-violent form, depending on circumstances and relationships of forces. This is a certain form of negativity, but it is not the one that Zizek prefers because it lacks the decisionist, therefore, in fact, sovereign element involved, involved, oh, shit, involved in the notions of divine violence and of a passage from the simple transgression of the law or resistance to the oppressive order into a terror, 
which is essentially defined by him in terms of the collective absence of fear of the consequences of an uncompromising wager on the possibility of equality and justice. Therefore, absence of the fear of death, both given and received. This is incidentally one of the important differences between Zizek and Badiou, the necessity or not of confronting death in the implementation of the communist idea, therefore also the existence of the death drive. This is where, as we know, Zizek not only privileges the Leninist interpretation of Marxism, especially the idea that revolution must be possible where its social conditions of possibility, social or economic conditions of possibility are not given because it creates retrospectively its own conditions or prerequisites in the course of its development and in fact always represents a decision to try the impossible whose consequences are unknown and probably fearful. But he also returns from the Leninist concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat to its model or urbilt in the Jacobin terror whose essential motto in his eyes is Robespierre's inverted tautology, citizens, did you want a revolution without a revolution? All by Zizek brilliantly manages to find a correspondence between this formula with the Hegelian notion of a revolution that includes within itself a reformation, or rather precisely because of this brilliant, too brilliant, in my opinion, demonstration I believe that we face here a profound dilemma, dilemma concerning the use of the philosophical scheme of the negation of the negation or the negativity which affects every use we can make of revolutionary schemes when we try to apply them to combating the conservative functions of democracy as a system of the disciplining of the exploited classes and the processes of de-democratization within the democratic form of the state. A revolution not without revolution does not simply name the, re the reiteration of the democratic idea, but it names an excess or decision, or even better, as Bruno Bostels rightly suggests in his, in my opinion, excellent discussion of Zizek, an act without which revolution returns to reform, and reform to reiteration of the status quo. So it is the perilous excess without which there is no difference between reformation and reform, and the internal subjective reformation of the revolutionaries become indiscernible from a reform imposed from above. But it is also for the same reason a leap outside of the dialectic of the institutions or a sublime intrusion of the real into the symbolic, whereby, as Hegel perfectly knew and explained in the phenomenology, the revolutionaries become subjectively unable to distinguish between a destruction of, to distinguish a destruction of the old order from their own self-destruction inasmuch as they are themselves products and examples of the old order. This is the problem of the quality of the negation, the real negation, if I may say so, of the effective negativity that Zizek profoundly works through on the tracks of a re-Hegelianized Marxism, but also an extremist reading of Hegel, and that we can consider his contribution to the aporetic problem of the anticipations of communism, fully accepting, at least in my case, his starting point in the critique of the inability of progressivist Marxism to cope with the transformative capacities of capitalism, but acknowledging that the distinction between an internal and an external negation, a determinate and an indeterminate negativity is extremely hard to find and ripe with unexpected returns of the death drive. Let me now say something similar about Hart and Negri. As I suggested briefly a moment ago, I take the operaista legacy to remain very important in their thinking but this leads to another kind of difficulty located in the immediate vicinity of what is probably their most interesting contribution to post-Marxist thought, namely their reformulation of the concept of the productive force in biopolitical terms. 
involving what they call a confusion of the traditional, traditionally distinct processes of production and reproduction in the sense of reproduction of the living capital itself made of living individuals who enter the labor process as producers under the control of capital. Therefore, not fearing to be accused of precisely confusion on the side of orthodox Marxists. And finally, leads them to the overcoming of the category labor as it was identified by industrial capitalism all the way along from the industrial revolution to the transformations implemented by Fordism and welfare capitalism under the impact of workers' struggles inside and outside the factory, but also under the imaginary threat of the Bolshevik revolution rightly identified by Negri in a brilliant essay from the 70s as a decisive cause of the Keynesian reform into transformation of the category labor into a more general, more diverse category of activity that merges manual labor with intellectual labor and combines the rational utilitarian dimensions of the exploitation of the labor force with the effective dimension of the reproduction of the labor force, which in what I believe is an ironic manner, since in other places they enthusiastically endorse a queering of the categories of gender amounting to a relativization and a blurring of the distinctions inherited from the bourgeois family between the feminine and the masculine role and identities, they do not hesitate to call a feminization of labor, a feminization which is also a sort of naturalistic or organic denaturation. As we know, many things here are, the, are at the same time highly interesting and also highly disputable, especially for Marxists, both in terms of conceptual schematism and in, term, in terms of the interpretation of historical tendencies. The discussion of the category labor is especially interesting because while it keeps faithful to the idea that labor is centrally a political notion as much as an economic one, or the discussion of revolutionary politics must remain directly rooted in the activities of the producers, if not necessarily identified with this or that historical figure of the worker, at least must remain rooted in a discussion of what happens in, and so to speak, to the production process, it also suggests that the transformation of the category labor into a multilateral activity of the individual, or in fact only thinkable as a trans-individual activity, always already requiring the cooperation and the various forms of cooperation among the individuals, which for Marx form the horizon of the communist transformation of the productive forces, is now considered a fait accompli under capitalism itself. Most readers of Negri and Hart, except their enthusiastic supporters, resist this idea, but I believe that it deserves a careful discussion nevertheless. There is a subtle, in fact, conflictual relationship to the utopian element in Marx involved here, because on the one hand, Hart and Negri tend to criticize an analysis of the tensions between a narrow utilitarian institution of wage labor dominated by the imperatives of capitalism accumulation and a wider notion of activity involving its multiple anthropological dimensions, manual and intellectual, rational and effective, that would postpone it to the future in the name of the critique of alienation. Whereas on the other hand, they project the utopia into the present and make it the permanent horizon of our understanding of contemporary capitalism. The great leap forward here is accomplished when, where Marx explained that the process of production was not only a production of goods, commodities, new means of production, but also a reproduction of the capitalist social relations themselves. They, Hart and Negri, now explain that the reproduction in its most immediate and vital aspects has become so profoundly integrated into the production process that it explodes or blows up the control of the existing forms of property, regulation, disciplinary power, and gives rise, at least potentially, of course, this potentiality is the whole question, 
to an autonomy or an exodus of the living forces and their cooperation from the command out of the command of capital. Are we not here in the most blatant form of utopia or even wishful thinking in the name of historical materialism? In any case, we are certainly in a typical form of progressivism, in particular because Hart and Negri have an avowed tendency to generalize what they present as the most advanced and also subversive forms of activity within contemporary bourgeois society, shaking the old territorialities and the old forms of the division of labor as the already present image of the future that is awaiting every productive activity, especially, yes, I know what you're going to tell me, especially for what concerns the intellectualization and the feminization of labor. My own critique of Hart and Negri's grand narrative would focus on the following aspects of their argument, but also for the same reasons, emphasizing a question that with their help and qua communist subjects who are also thinking subjects, we cannot not ask not keep in mind in our anticipations. First, I would say that they have a tendency to ignore the counter tendencies. In the developments that they describe or imagine, therefore enhancing, yes, an evolutionist view of the development and transformations of capitalism. This is particularly true for their description of the intellectualization of labor, famously started by Negri under the heading of his reading of the single page where Marx used the name general intellect in English, which plays a crucial role in their argument that the law of value linked to capitalist exploitation is now transformed because the profits of capital, or as they prefer to say, the new rent extracted by capital essentially derives from a cooperation among the producers mediated by processes of communication and intellectual innovation whose result is not measurable. This would be the emergence of the new commons, which in turn anticipate or already engages, engage, excuse me, a new communism. They fully endorse and extrapolate in this respect the theory and the practice of the so-called creative commons. But they ignore or minimize the counter tendency, namely the gigantic forms of standardization, mechanization, and intensification of intellectual labor, especially in the fields of information technology, which through the use of iron discipline and savage constraint on precarious workforce, testified in the new intensity of physical suffering in the computerized activities, forces cooperation to return under the law of value, and so to speak, remakes physical labor out of intellectual labor. Similarly, on the side of the feminization of labor and the integration of the effective dimension of the reproduction of the living forces of production into the productive process itself, they ignore the counter tendency which has been widely emphasized by recent debates on the uses of the newly fashionable category of the care to recreate forms of slavery especially targeting the feminine workforce from the global south through the generaliz generalization of semi-controlled, semi-criminalized migrations, but also the good old housewives and social workers of our developed countries are subjected to that process. Or perhaps they do not ignore these counter tendencies. In that case, they should develop their indications concerning the conflictual dimension that more than ever affects the tensions between exploited labor and human activity in general, including its contradictory relationship to forms of coerced or autonomous cooperation. And they could contribute thus to a discussion of the extent to which real subsumption of every aspect of the human life is in fact impossible or reaches a limit within capitalism itself, which makes it impossible to create a pure capitalism or an absolute capitalism, not even in the age of neoliberalism, so that the outcome of capitalist development must remain suspended and uncertain. But this is, in a sense, a reverse reading of their notion of exodus. Second and final, I will cut the uh, 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 third part, which in any case could not 
be really developed. I anticipated that this would be too long, but not to that extent. Second, I would say that the enormous interest of Hart and Negri's discussion of the biopolitical dimension of the transformations of labor and activity also lays in the fact of imposing a fresh consideration of the relationship between Marxism and the issue of anthropological differences, of which the manual and the intellectual, the rational and the affective, but above all the sexual differences and the differences of gender roles as typical are typical examples. Again, they are perhaps suggesting a question that they too quickly resolve, or whose resolution in their terms is not the only possible one. This is because a notion of biopolitical reason and the productivity of bodies, these are their terms, allows for the introduction into the political composition of the multitude of all the differences without there is no representation of the human, but which also can never become simply and once forever encapsulated into administrative, sociological, or psychological categories beyond the simple model of the organization of industrial and commercial labor. But it also tends, this notion of biopolitical reason or biopolitics, to homogenize paradoxically the multiplicity or diversity of social relations, subjective positions, conflicts between dominations and resistances which it tries to articulate. I would suggest that the order of multiplicity that is involved in the consideration of all the anthropological differences is in fact greater than what such concepts as productive force or biopolitics allow it to think. This is not to say that each time a problematic of the common or commonality is not involved, especially in the form of collective struggles against the use of differences to isolate and oppose individuals, and attempts at basing solidarities or rela on, relations and on relations and on interdependencies. But there is nothing that guarantees that these diverse types of differences will contribute to the same or to a single total idea of communism, or only in the most abstract form, that is claiming equality, for example, however important it is politically. Once again, this is a problem that we may want to inscribe in the aporetic column of communist thinking as a diverse interpretation of the transformation of the world, rather than a universally agreed element of the history that we are making. But again, in the, like in the case of Zizek, there would be no way to ascertain the diversity of the interpretations and ask about the real contradictions that they reveal if nobody had taken the risk of boldly choosing one of the branches of a conceptual antinomy. The third announced part was only a sketch, and I will, with your permission and with my excuse, uh, stop uh, here and leave its development for a possible written version. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. I'm sure there are questions. In order to change the order, I, I, I want to just start um, with a, a very simple question so that then um, uh, Slavoj can, can also. Um, and it, it's very simple about you announced in the beginning that you were going to explain or, tr or say something more, but then you didn't about the dialectic of we the communists or they the communists. Right? And it, it seemed to me that the suggestion which you then confirmed in the last lines seems to be that maybe you're more convinced that we should abandon the term or at least leave it in this sort of apoetic space. But then... Which term? Communism. And especially the identification with the, the sort of the, the notion of to talk about we or rather than they as the communists. And this is related to another question that you mentioned at the beginning, which is when you, when you refer to existing communists who said there are and there have been 
uh, and numerous communists, including those you said that for reasons good or bad, might reject the use of this term, the term communism. So no, no, the term materialism. Ah, the term materialism. The term materialism, not the term communism. Absolutely not the term communism. But could no, the term, the term idealism. Excuse me, the term idealism. That was not clear. Uh, uh, let's uh, pause for, for for a second. But could you uh, could uh, you say something a little bit Marx, more about about them? About the, the sort of the, the play between we the communists and, versus and the they the communists, and, the, and whether there are there might be reasons, good reasons, for abandoning the term communism. No, except materialism. I, I, no, leave aside materialism yeah, leave for a minute. Uh, leave, leave materialism aside for a minute. Um, um, uh, what is funny is that um, uh, you um, uh, 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 cleverly um, uh, uh, anticipate something that in the <laughs> unpronounced and in fact largely uh, 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 unfinished uh, um, uh, uh, third part uh, I uh, uh, started to uh, uh, discuss, not, not to say to play with, huh? uh, but which I take very seriously, um, uh, namely um, the question um, uh, uh, of whether in as much as communists, the communists, we the communists, are doing politics, therefore are, uh, this is absolutely not original, uh, uh, taking uh, um, uh, 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 part, taking part in uh, uh, ongoing struggles, um, uh, developing movements, um, fighting for um, <clears throat> determined objectives, I will not mention uh, uh, um, uh, what's the, suddenly this is very interesting. The name of the movement on Zuccotti Place, uh, um, Occupy, Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, because that would be sheer demagogy. So I don't mention it. Uh, um, uh, so, so in as much as they are taking a, a, a part as what I tentatively called de organizers, uh, 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 that is, um, both trying to cross the boundaries of organizations which are linked to uh, 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 specific uh, 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 movements, and uh, um, uh, uh, trying to, in a sense, to problematize the limits of the organization as such. Uh, again, not something very original. Uh, these communists uh, um, um, always call themselves like that or um, um, are recognizable, if you like, identifi identifiable under that name. Uh, I uh, uh, would not give an answer to that, uh, neither in the form of, um, uh, uh, in any case, in, not in the form of a yes or no, uh, um, uh, which you may consider a form of very weak commitment to the idea of communism, uh, because it would be something like it depends. Uh, but it's also, I believe, a lesson of history. If you think that Garcia Linera is a communist, does he present himself in these terms? Uh, if you think, but that's not the uh, two, two Marxist. Uh, so um, I, um, um, so I would, uh, I would, I, I would consider that this question is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is a very important practical question, a very important. Uh, um, a question of the uh, interaction, if you like, <coughs> of names and and processes or uh, 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 realities. But then, if you ask the question to me, uh, my answer will be, in fact, an ambiguous, 
ambiguous. Um, first, I'm completely committed to, as much as one can say I am, I mean, uh, subjective. Prove it, you would say. Uh, to uh, 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 what I described as the object of the desire of subjects under the communist idea, or with reference to the communist idea, that is, radically change the world in order for the lives of humans to become changed. Even if, of course, and who would deny that? I consider that this is an extremely abstract uh, 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 formulation, that it can be interpreted in uh, completely different uh, uh, ways by many. And above all, and above all, this is what I tried to say in a sort of imaginary uh, dispute or, or, or confrontation with, uh, with uh, 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 Alain Badiou, I uh, um, uh, called for the um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, critical uh, 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 understanding um, or discussion of what it entails to collectively to collectively um, um, gather gather one way or another visibly or invisibly um, uh, uh, under such uh, an, 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 an idea. And second, I repeat what I said, but that will be very... Uh, because what I presented, I'm aware this was both very heavy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and at the same time uh, probably much too uh, 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 schematic as the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, antithetic pattern of anticipations concerning the revolutionary transformation of capitalism uh, illustrated by uh, 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 the discourses of Zizek on one side and the discourse of uh, uh, Hart and Negri uh, uh, on, the other, on the other side. These are questions which I completely want to appropriate. Uh, I want to uh, be able to discuss each and every of their uh, uh, concepts, each and, uh, each and every of their uh, 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 terms, um, um, but I uh, completely uh, um, uh, uh, endorse, endorse the uh, um, uh, uh, problem, if you like, uh, that uh, it seems to me circulates, if you like, uh, among these uh, 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 discourses. So, for me, the they is also a we, and there the circle begins again. I mean, uh, what is it to be a we? Uh, who are we? Uh, how do we make a we? Great Hegelian question, great Freudian question, great Lacanian question. Uh, don't be afraid. I will be short. I was uh, deeply touched by your intervention because I just said that we don't have another, not even two, three hours now to go because you really raised some fundamental questions. So let me be as precise as possible. I will ignore the first extremely important topic, the first part of your talk, uh, which I think is, in a certain formal theoretical sense, crucial. What you describe as, and I liked how you used a very precise term avoided by Badiou, communist interpolation by the idea. Uh, and then where is the difference? Is it only one idea or whatever? You know, I liked when you said now, when you wanted to describe, try to describe your commitment, when you, you didn't worse use the word, the word idea, you used an almost Lacanian, I hope consciously, formulation, the object of desire, no? So I claim that here I find, although I'm very solidary with him, a problem with Alain. If I were to have now, this is the ersatz for my, for your third part, that if I were to have time to develop it, I would try, maybe I would have failed to prove that there is also or has to be uh, 
a formal difference in the very mode of interpolation of or non-interpolation between how communist and other interpolations on behalf of an uh, ego ideal work. And I think the path was shown precisely to you with this very refined difference between idea and, okay, object, but we know that object is a very precise thing with Lacan. And I will try here, I hope Bruno, you will be again the bad guy forced into defending Alain a little bit, in the text that you at the end quoted of Alain, the Berlin text on communism, he does something that is perplexing to me. When he tries to define communist idea, and you know how, once I criticized him for this idea being too close to Kantian regulative idea, and to cut a long story short, he exploded, no? But uh, strangely enough, in two of his texts, at least, he himself makes that reference. He said communism is something like a Kantian regulative idea, and then he says, because if we don't take it as a regulative idea, but as a, let's call it in Kantian terms, constitutive idea, we are into totalitarianism. We force the real and so on. So the way he described is, correct me, please interrupt me immediately, Bruno, if I'm wrong. His theory is almost, I'm tempted to say, of idea of communism in Berlin talk, a kind of Kantian transcendental illusion. He says, we have event which is real, but event as such, because of its rarity, structural poverty, cannot mobilize the people. So we have to construct a historical narrative which makes event into part of historical continuity. It's not true, but that's the way to mobilize people. And this is the communist idea. So I'm not so much afraid of his dangerous Stalinism in the sense of, oh, if you say idea, you have the right to kill people, whatever, but in how quickly then he withdraws into this all too suspicious Kantian relativization. In other words, I somehow, here I am an old, whatever, I don't even know how to call myself, whatever, for the truth, I am an old opponent of this Plato, Spinoza, you find it all the time, idea of, you know, there is a pure truth, but to sell it to the people, you need a beautiful lie. This, I, this, I had the same expression yeah, mind. yeah, this uh, would be my problem uh, there. As to Negri, divine violence, and so on, let me make a point where I think, my God, here, I was surprised by your friendly criticism because I thought we agree. I consider the Marx preface 59 preface text one of the worst things he wrote. Pure, re you don't think so, pure regression to a certain relatively vulgar mechanic causality. We have first the real level productive forces relations where even relatively unambiguously productive forces are what sets the rhythm not the most sophisticated reading of the text. Okay, you can maybe play this, but nonetheless, I, I, this is my, okay, maybe Marx is more sophisticated, but the way my basic critique of Hart and Negri is that they certainly rely on a, on a kind of even relatively evolutionary reading of Marx. My idea is if we take the most vulgar reading of Marx, you know, productive forces develop and then uh, the relations of production cannot contain them, bam, in a, it explodes, new, product, new relations of production has to emerge and so on and so on. Isn't it that they just try to renovate this narrative by locating this point of where old relations of productions no longer work into this new biopolitics where the main object of production is direct, immediate production of life and so on and so on. I, 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 
I, I don't buy this, at least what I see, just I will finish soon, what I will see as a certain evolution, evolutionism, evolutionism on their part. The second problem, I, sorry? should have invited Michael Hart. He would have told us if that was his understanding. Okay, but I had this conflict with him already, friendly conflict. The second point is theoretical. All this stuff about multitudes. I agree with those who claim that, and this is not an empirical statement. That's important. It's for me an, like, a priori theoretical point that, to be brutal, all the examples that they present of these productive multitudes and so on and so on are modern phenomena which in immanently presuppose a well-functioning state to be possible. I challenge precisely in Berlin Negri himself, I ask him a simple question. My God, were you there, Bruno? No. Uh, you were there. You can, I hope, if I bribe you enough, confirm. But, uh, I asked him a simple question. I told him this, and then I asked him, can you tell me of one example of multitude which would have, like, immanently broken out of state Constraints. Because my further point is that this is for me the symptom of empire, the book. After all this stuff against the state, multitude, you know how the book finishes with three proposals, universal citizenship, uh, universal minimum income, blah, blah, which are for me unimaginable outside the state. You know what was Alain's answer? I hope you will confirm. He was thinking for some 10 seconds confused, and then he said uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, which is for me a very strange example. The what? Uh, Chinese Cultural La Revolution Courte, yeah, yeah, which for me precisely, it was brutally crushed by one million soldiers or whatever at the end. Mm -hmm.